Hello, Peter Knight here with Unit 3.1 of Fundamentals of Physical Geography, and here we're talking about the planetary context of physical geography. A lot of the things in which physical geographers are interested are controlled by the Earth's planetary or astronomical context. For example, Earth's orientation and orbit around the Sun control the seasons and define the polar circles, the tropics and the equator. One of the basics of physical geography is therefore knowing about Earth as a planet and how its position in the solar system determines many physical geography processes and environmental conditions. That's what this session is all about. Before we start, I'd like you to take a minute and just think about these couple of questions. What is the Arctic Circle and why is it at 66 and a half degrees north? And in the Northern Hemisphere, why is it colder in winter, even though we're actually closer to the sun then than we are in the summer? Pause the video, have a think about those and try and write down answers to them. Then come back and see if you can pick up the answers as we work through the session. The answers to those questions and to lots of other questions in physical geography actually begin with this situation, this diagram. Physical geography starts with the Earth in space. With this diagram, we can start to think about solar energy, which is one of the major, one of the major energy inputs to the Earth's surface. We can think about Earth's orbit around the sun, and we can think about Earth's rotation. Those three things underpin a huge proportion of what we'll be studying in physical geography, a huge fraction of Earth's surface processes and features. The orbit around the Sun is elliptical and we orbit once per year. That orbit is what defines the year. The distance between the Earth and the Sun varies between about 91 and about 94 million miles. The closest point is called the perihelion and our most distant point from the Sun is called the aphelion. The perihelion is in January, the aphelion is in July. The distance around the Earth's orbit is 584 million miles. So Earth is traveling in its orbit at 66,700 miles an hour, or 18.5 miles per second. Imagine what that feels like. Well, actually, you don't have to imagine it because that's what we're doing right now. Now, having shown you that diagram, and there are other diagrams like it, I'm going to show you later on in the presentation, I need to issue a, a warning. Beware of the distorted scale of illustrations that you'll see of the solar system or of Earth in space. So this six centimetre globe that I'm holding up in the picture there, if that were the real Earth, how far do you think away from it the sun would be to be at the, at the right scale? Well, if the Earth was six centimetres across, the sun would be 700 metres away and six and a half metres in diameter. So if you're holding a little globe like that and you're wondering where the sun is, 700 metres away. So when you see these diagrams, remember the scale is necessarily very compressed to fit the picture usefully onto a page. Now, one really important point about the Earth's orbit is that the axis of rotation, the pin through the middle of the Earth that you might imagine the Earth rotating around, the polar axis, that axis of rotation is not perpendicular to the plane of the orbit. So the plane around which the Earth goes around the Sun, the polar axis is tilted relative to that plane, as shown in this diagram, by 23 and a half degrees at the moment. That changes over the course of time, but at the moment the axis is tilted at about 23 and a half degrees. Now this means that different things are happening at different locations at different times of the year. For example, at the solstices, one pole points towards the sun at 23 and a half degrees, while the other pole points away from the sun. At the equinoxes, neither pole is pointing towards or away from the sun. In the picture here, you can imagine that the equinoxes that the pole is pointing or tilting sideways to the sun rather than towards it and away from it. And if you look at what's happening, for example, at the, uh, the June solstice and the December solstice, see how things are going differently at the northern polar regions and at the southern polar regions. So in the summer solstice, the northern polar region tilted towards the sun is getting loads of daylight. The southern polar region tilted away from the sun, the southern hemisphere winter, isn't getting much light at all. And the opposite is true at the December solstice. 
And this slide illustrates how lots of features of Earth's geography are determined by this tilt of the axis. For example, the Arctic Circle and the Antarctic Circle are defined by the areas that get 24 hour daylight at one point in the year or 24 hour darkness at another point in the year. The tropics and the equator are defined by points at which the sun appears to be vertically directly overhead at some point in the year. So seasonal changes in daylight hours and the angle of solar illumination depend upon this situation. So we've looked at the solstice and this slide now looks at the equinox. At the equinox, there's no effect of the tilt at this time of year. This kind of illustrates what Earth would be like without the tilt. Equal 12 hour day length everywhere, no seasons, no Arctic or Antarctic circles, no tropics, but constant steady pole would decrease in the angle of illumination and the amount of energy arriving at the surface. That isn't what the planet's like, but just for a moment at the point of equinox, we can see what it would be like if it were. An important point to remember for later in the course is that Earth's tilt and orbit change through time. And that's one of the main causes of long term climate change, and the origin of ice ages and so on. You might also want to pause and take some time to look at this slide and think about the implications of it. It shows some of the things that are determined by this astronomical setting, the orbit and the tilt that we've talked about so far. All of the things that are shown on this, this list and illustrated on this diagram relate to these controlling factors, Earth's orbit, Earth's rotation, the angle of tilt of the Earth's axis. Just pause the video and take some time to think through these and make sure that you understand exactly how they relate to what we've just been talking about. I'll put up another little video later on as well uh, that, that goes into a little bit more detail on some of this. These next two slides give a little bit more information on the last item on that list, ocean tides. Again, remember the scale errors in these cartoon diagrams that you're seeing. This first diagram illustrates the effect, first of all, of the Earth's rotation, and secondly, of the gravitational pull of the moon on the film of water around the Earth's surface that we call the oceans. You can see the effect of the spin and the gravitational pull of the moon stretches that oceanic envelope out in one direction and necessarily therefore thins it down in different in the opposing direction. Underneath that, underneath that envelope, the earth is spinning. So the spinning earth is effectively passing underneath areas of more pulled and less pulled water. The gravity of the moon has the biggest effect on the tides because the moon is so close, but the sun also has an effect on the tides. And the total effect is the combination of the lunar tide and the solar tide. When the moon and the sun are aligned, the two effects combine to give us extreme tides, the spring tide. When the moon and the sun are not in the same direction, when they're in opposite directions, as in the, the bottom diagram here, then they counteract each other and we get smaller tides, what we call neap tides. The Earth rotates every 24 hours, so each point on Earth moves through these bulges effectively every day, two peaks, two troughs, so a two-tide diurnal cycle. The moon rotates around the Earth every 28 days and arrives at the same position in its orbit about 50 minutes later each day. So the position of each bulge moves later by 50 minutes per day. So if it were high tide at 1 p.m. today, it will be about 1.50 p.m. Uh, tomorrow. This is further complicated by solar effects and by coastal geometry, patterns of shorelines and bathymetry and so on. So some locations have much greater tides than others. A typical tidal range around the planet is about two to four meters. But some places such as, for example, the Bay of Fundy in southeast Canada, which is, has one of the highest tidal ranges in the world, that has a tidal range of about 16 and a half meters. Now we're breaking today's lecture up into two sections and we'll come back in a minute to talk about uh, Coriolis force. But take a break and while we're having a break, just try to think up the best way you can of explaining to somebody exactly what 94 million miles feels like and what it must feel like to be spinning at 800 kilometers an hour while flying around the sun at 18 miles per second. 
One of the interesting things or one of the important things about physical geography isn't just to try to memorize things, but to somehow try and internalize them, to understand them, to have a good, clear picture of them uh, in your mind. When you've had a break and had a little think about that, uh, there'll be another video for you uh, talking about Coriolis force, which is another effect of the Earth's planetary context.